College years are expected to be the most exciting time of a young person's life. And it was just that for an 18-year-old Ole Miss student, Seth Dickinson, who was working on a degree in public policy leadership. But that all came crashing down on March 14, 2015, when suddenly he suffered the most unlikely medical incident that nearly cost him his life. Now, four years later, Seth has an incredible story of hope, healing, and sheer determination. Seth, thanks for being here today. Much obliged for having me. Yeah, number one, I think probably a good place to start is where are you from and who's your mama? I'm from Mantechi, Mississippi. My mother's name is Teresa. She is literally my mother, Teresa. Your mother, Teresa. And, of course, your dad's pretty famous up in Itawaba County, too. Infamous in some circles. He yeah. is the sheriff. Okay, so is that kind of like being a preacher's kid? Well, my, my, my preacher was actually my grandfather growing up, so... Oh, wow, so you had all kinds of opportunity to be evil. Well, I couldn't go one mile over the speed limit or go <laughs> one dollar under the tithes, so yeah. I was always kind of watched. You're always, always in trouble. So, um, when you were growing up, what did you think you were going to be when you grew up? A preacher. When I was four, I loved to get my little church hymnal, and I'd sing and whatever verses I could remember from children's church, and yeah. then I decided I wanted to be a surgeon, mm -hmm. and I thought about being a high school teacher, and I realize I'm not smart enough to be a surgeon, and I don't have the patience that Mississippi teachers have. That's right. And then I moved on, decided I wanted to be a banker. Numbers got involved again, and I decided I'm going to be a lawyer. You got the suit and the tie, though. I can dress every once in a while. You can do that right. Now you look sharp today. I'd, of course, I forgot my tie. But no. I got to tell you this, though. You must have been pretty sharp because you, you got out of school and you got into the Honors College up yes, at Ole Miss. I did. And you were going to study public policy. Mm -hmm. That was your initial. That was your initial plan, right? That was my goal going in. I knew I wanted to do something to help Mississippi from my background. Public policy was my outlet. They yeah. had recruited me hard. I bought in. They invested in me. Money talks. I listened. Ended up at Ole Miss in fall 2014. So, what kind of high school student were you? I was involved. Yeah. In a class of 63 people, you have to have every role. I was the school Twitter account operator. I did the hashtags, I made the shirts, I was class president all 13 years, kindergarten through 12th grade. They were mostly all my cousins, so yeah. they kind of had to vote for me. So in high school, Seth Dickinson, I would sing hymns down the hall. I was the grandfather of the school. The grandfather of the, the school. The grandfather of Mantachi High School. Is that, no, what exactly does that mean, you were the grandfather? I was the person you could come to if you had a problem mm -hmm. and needed the solution. And I was a person you'd come to if you needed sage advice, a joke, uh, hope, I would like to say. Or they could just make fun of me because they weren't as goofy as I was. <laughs> so you were wise beyond your years. You, you did obviously very well in school. You graduated. You got up to Ole Miss. What was your first semester like? I did what any college freshman would want to do. I got involved in Greek life. I moved into a dorm. Mm -hmm. And then my first semester impacted me when I walked into my first class on a Tuesday at 1 o'clock. And I sat down in the classroom. And for the first time, I was seated next to somebody that looked different than me. Yeah. Coming from a small town. And I looked around the table at the Honors College and realized there's something out there. And, of course, I had my notions my pre that were preconceived because of my upbringing. And then we got to talking that first day. And I realized there's a bigger world out here than my town, than my mentality. Mm -hmm. and, but I used the community foundations I had been given in Mantachi to know everybody, right. to be that person you can reach out to. And finally, my first semester really opened me up to a world that was bigger than my own. I had a mind that was mine that I could be fed into, a mind that I could explore with. I also had a lot of fun. <laughs> I am about to say, there had to be a fun component to it. I did. I got yeah. involved. In you drove over the speed limit, and you probably cut a little bit under the ties. Oh, plenty. Sorry, Mother, yeah. if you're seeing this. Yeah. So, But the first semester was pretty normal yeah. experience. Went to the football games. You, you met new people. You yes. had all kinds. The whole world was ahead of you. I was very thankful for the opportunity that I yeah. was given. And then that day was second semester, wasn't it? It was spring break. Spring break. Spring break, Saturday night. I was going back to school the next morning. Yeah. And life had been great. Things were okay. Things were happy. It was a normal day. I was packing my stuff back up to go, and I get a headache. Mm -hmm. And that was March 14, 2015. And from the moment that first headache 
hit, I was expected to live for six minutes. It wasn't a, just a typical headache though, was it? It was like crushing. It, it was a pain like I hope to never feel again. It was a feeling that something was inside of me, inside of my head. It was more, more than a throb, it was a presence. It was yeah. a headache that wasn't dull or sharp. It was a headache that was just a presence within me. Yeah. And I knew I had a problem. You had a problem, were you alone? I was not alone at the time. My parents were home. I had gone to my room after working out. I was on the phone with a friend at the time. Yeah. I was on the phone talking and then my speech starts to slur. Wow. And she of course says something's wrong. So I hang up, call my mother, and I look down at the phone to hit her contact and I couldn't think. I couldn't move my hand to, to, to get to her contact. She's my favorite, it's easy to hit. Yeah. Finally, I, I get it, the phone goes down. She was up that night doing my laundry, thank goodness. And I get out the words, come here. And she runs upstairs. She was a registered nurse, knew there were signs of something very wrong happening. Yeah. She knows we have to get me to the hospital. Calls my dad who was home that night. They take me to the top of the stairs and I pass out. Yeah. Things are getting worse at that time, but I decide I'm stubborn. I decide I'm gonna scoop myself down the stairs. So I go down the stairs and I decide I'm gonna stand up and walk to my chair to wait on help to get there. They had called my uncle down. My dad, of course, bring the sheriff, had his vehicle there. They were gonna take me to the hospital. While they're pulling around, I started walking across the room. I get halfway across the room and I feel it pop. The aneurysm at that moment had ruptured and I felt that. And your brain is not something you're aware you have, especially right. as a college male, but I felt it. I felt what, like, like a balloon that was bursting. I felt blood rush across my brain. I felt crevices inside of me and I fell out. And I remember looking up at my floor, looking up at the ceiling in my floor, up at a light and the thought hit me at 18 years old that how ironic is it, Seth, the floor you grew up in is the floor you're gonna die in. And that's when my breath starts getting shallow and I start to blur out. But I knew my mother was holding me. I yeah. was aware of that. And I told myself, Seth, you can't die in your mother's arms because she couldn't live with herself that way. Wow. So I fight. Mm -hmm. I take more breaths. I get fight harder and harder. They finally load me up in the vehicle. And I remember pulling out of my driveway, taking me to the Tupelo Hospital, looking back at my house and thinking, this is the last time you're gonna see that. And I remember that. Thankfully, they put me on life support as soon as we got to Tupelo. From there, went to Memphis and died twice that night. You died twice that I died night? Died twice that night. Do you have any recollection of that happening? Memories, mostly. I yeah. could hear. I could hear everything. I couldn't see, I was not conscious, but I could hear. I could hear tears, I could hear screaming and wailing, I could hear yeah. the beeps. Uh, the worst part of it was, was not the pain at this point. The yeah. pain is something I could get used to because it was, it was suffering. Right. And there's only a certain level of suffering you can hit and then you're, you're ready to give up. But because I could hear, I knew I couldn't. But I could hear crying more and more and more and I could hear, I love you Seth, I love you Seth from different voices and then it ends. And I remember the very end. And I remember the, the out of body experience you have. Mm -hmm. The looking down at myself on an operating room table, a man over me, inside of me, and I'm thinking, put that back. And then looking up and seeing black. And that's when I got really cold and it hit me, it's over. Wow. And then memories start playing back and you have the experience of your life all over again. Yeah. And I finally see my life picking up and going faster and faster. I'm in high school again. I'm back at college. I'm going through a rush. I'm doing all the things a freshman would do. And then it comes up to that day. And I see memories that I had just lived recently. And I think to myself, you've got to slow down. And then it goes black again. There's nothing left. And I think, now what? But I look up again. And at the very end, I saw my regrets. I saw every regret I had ever had. I saw memories that I never made. I saw chances I never took. I saw times I was mad and shouldn't have been. I saw times I should have said I love you to somebody. And the, and the rest is history. Well, the rest is history. You obviously 
did survive. I did. But how long were you out? I was out, I believe, six days. You were in a coma, right? Yes. Yeah, you were in a coma. I, I still am amazed that, number one, thank goodness your dad was a sheriff, and he probably drove 900 miles an hour to yes. Tupelo to get you there. How did they get you? Did they helicopter you to, to Memphis? or They were going to, but the weather. The weather was bad, so you ended up there, but you were able to get care in time. Yes. That, that literally saved your life, too. I had access to a good hospital. You had access, which is very important, and we'll talk about that a little bit later because that's become a passion of yes. yours. So you were out for six days. You have no memory of that. I could hear. You could hear? I could hear. Wow. I could hear, and I remember hearing things, and I remember the memories of people being around me and talking to me in voices. Yeah. And then I come to. And that's when I knew something's got to go. I realized I was paralyzed. And you were mute, too. You couldn't speak. You couldn't move. I couldn't do anything, but I could think. You could think. From that first day in the Honors College, going back to that, I could think. Right. I had a mind. I was trapped inside of my own body, but I had a mind that was as free as ever. So what did you do? I mean, did you start, I mean, did you recite poetry? What did you do to start thinking? Because you were, you, you were laying there mm. thinking, okay, I've got to figure out how to pull myself out of this. Mostly I felt sorry for myself. Okay, I was going to ask. Yeah. I was going to ask because, uh, you know, I didn't think you were totally Superman. Cause oh, no, the, no. But you did. I mean, I mean self-pity, which is completely yeah. logical. I would hope. You know, because you're 18 years old and you suddenly are trapped and right. paralyzed. I went through every emotion, mostly right. anger. Yeah. There's no way I, I was not resilient in those moments. I was broken and right. I knew it. But as soon as I could get up again and think, that's when it came to something, to a head, I would say, that I was going to fight. Yeah. I was going to say, because obviously um, there was some resilience already built in there. But at, at what point did you just say, you know what, this is not who Seth Texas is. I'm not going to lay here for the rest of my life. When I got to Atlanta, when I went to Shepherd Center in Atlanta, Georgia, they had taken me there to a specialty rehab hospital. Yeah. Uh, and I was told by doctors I would likely never walk again. Really? I was told on the scale of zero to 100 when they rate you, yeah. with zero being your nothing, with 100 being your perfectly normal, I was a four. I had no chance. And I just, after they told me that, I decided that's not who I'm going to be. Right. I'm not going to be somebody who sits here. So I was lying in my bed one night, looking up at the hospital room ceiling, all I could do. And a thought hit me, and it was the thought that ultimately changed my life and got me back here. What was that thought? That thought, looking up while feeling sorry for myself, was it, Seth, while you're trapped in your own body, there are Mississippians who are trapped in their circumstances too. Whether that be poverty or poor education, my background in public policy, I knew what the problems were, mm -hmm. and I was in my own kind of problem. And I realized I'm trapped. They're trapped too. I can't feel sorry for myself. If they're not going to feel sorry for their, their selves, they're going to live with it. It's my job to give my background, my rhetoric that I now had with their reality to get out of here to fight and get back to Mississippi. So that next day, I was fighting. What, what was the first thing that you did? Uh, the first thing I did, actually, when I could speak again, I told my nurse to put me in my chair, mm -hmm. the wheelchair, roll me up to the mirror. She rolled me to the mirror. I looked myself in that mirror. And being a good old Miss Rebel, I asked myself, Seth, are you ready? And through my actions, Mr. Ramsey, I answered, hell yeah, damn right. So every morning, that's been my tradition since that day. Every time I get up in the morning, did it today. Go to the mirror, look myself in the eye and say, Seth, are you ready? And through my actions, whether it be here in Jackson, in Oxford, in the law school, talking to somebody on the side of the road, I hope that my actions will always be hell yeah, damn right. You had, obviously, some very special people in your lives, your yes. parents, I mean, your family, your yes. friends. Talk about, did you have any special mentors? Yes. I, uh, I, would, I would like to say that I am nothing without the people that poured into me. Yeah. I, I did none of this by myself. I had good doctors. I had good nurses. Just because I'm stubborn doesn't make me special. Yeah. It's because of the people that cared about me, people like my parents, people like Dr. Ryan Upshaw at Ole Miss, Dr. Bob Brown, the faculty and staff that cared enough about me to remind me that even though I'm in my lowest of low, there's a mountaintop to get to, to get back to Ole Miss, to finish up, to fulfill my goals. It's people like that that made me who I am. How long did it take you to get from Atlanta back to Oxford? Well, I was discharged in July from Atlanta. I went back that fall. I was told I couldn't go back to school. 
So I did what any stubborn Mississippian would do, and I enrolled myself in online classes. Uh, and actually, the therapist that told me I would not go back to school, I sent her my report card of those online classes <laughs> uh, with uh, the writing, pucker up, sweetheart, on it, because the last thing I had told her was to kiss a certain part of me. <laughs> and then I was back in Oxford in January. Back in January. So nine, what is that, nine months later. I saw a quote from you, you said, you're not disabled, you're differently able. Yes. Yes. So you realized, okay, I've got a different paradigm here, mm -hmm. but I'm going to make the most out of what I've got. Right. When life gives you lemons, you get that Mississippi sweet in there and you make lemonade. Make lemonade. That's how I have to live. I am differently able, but I also realized from my time in Atlanta, it could have been so much worse. I was in therapy and I would see people to one side of me that were better off in their recovery. Yeah. So I knew, okay, Seth, you can get better. Right. But I could look the other way and see people who were so much worse than I was and are still not to the point I'm at. But see, you could have looked over at that guy that was doing better and yeah. said it's not fair. Right. But instead you said, no, I'm gonna, I'm, that's my goal. I'm not here to match him. I'm not here to beat him. I'm here to join him. Right. Just like them, the person on the other side that was worse than me, I can remember the point when I was that, that bad off. I'm gonna be on their level too. I'm gonna get better, but not forget where I've been. So Seth 1.0. The old you yes. versus the new you. What would you say would be the biggest uh, shift that you've, you've experienced? Uh, well, I think I'm better looking now. <laughs> but I would say that Seth 1.0 was a lot more close-minded. Yeah. Seth 1.0 didn't have the experience of knowing what it feels like to die with regrets. Right. Seth 1.0 was not as compassionate. Seth 1.0 did not care as much. Seth 1.0 lived his life like it was another fleet in the wind. Yeah. Seth 2.0 knows this is my second chance and I have to do something with it. This is not going to be for naught. I've been given my life charge and I'm going to use it, I hope, that Seth 1.0 would have said, sure, I'm going to do something. I'm going to get involved in policy or Mississippi mm -hmm. superficially. Seth 1.0 was going to go into politics. Seth 2.0 is going into personal relationships. And of course, when you, you graduated, you did graduate yeah, from I the did. Honors College. And, I did. But they chose you to speak. They did. I, my classmates very graciously allowed me to give the commencement address at our graduation. What were some of the bits of advice you gave? To live your life like the Mississippi River. Really? That, that has been my mantra throughout all of this. My life, I think I owe to the Mississippi River. No, explain. Uh, so to me, and I had this thought a lot when I was thinking in therapy, I love the metaphor of a river especially mm -hmm. the Mississippi River. Because if you think about it, we all start out like a stream. We all start from some one point. Mm -hmm. We go throughout, other streams pour into us, the tributaries of our life. We get stronger, we get faster, we get deeper, and we get wider. And ultimately, we find out we want to hit some gulf somewhere. We have a goal in mind. And there are going to be mountains in the way. And no matter what, you've got to carve through that. If, when I was thinking about when I would have really bad days in therapy, I felt like I would stagnate. My progress would stop. Now think about the river. The river never stops rolling. The river, no matter what it does, it keeps rolling along. And the state song of Mississippi, of course, says, Go Mississippi, keep rolling along. So at the times I would, I would hum that in therapy and think, when I feel stuck, most of all, the river, the current you can't see but you can feel, keeps pushing that river along. My current, my goal was to get back to Ole Miss. My current yeah. throughout has always changed. but. Within me there is a current, and my life, I hope, is to live like a river, and that's what I told my classmates, that no matter what, no matter what gets in your way, carve those mountains, carve those valleys, and keep rolling along. You talk about the regrets. I mean, obviously, and I've talked to, I have two or three friends that have mm -hmm. had near-death experiences, yes. and they have the same type thing, that they literally, it was almost like a list on a wall of the things that they really regretted to doing. Yes. Do you have a list of things yes. that you're like, okay, I'm just that you look at every once in a while going, okay, I need to make sure I do this, 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 and this. I do. It's an active list. It's an act, yeah. It is. I don't. I try not to do the comparison between who I was then and now. Right. But I do harken back to say, there are things then that I try to apply now. Yeah. And this list is more of an active prompt. I would say it's more of a a paragraph, a thesis sentence right. to my life story. And I'll, I'll try to live by that charge. But I would think it's like somebody lit a pilot light in you, I would they imagine. Did. Yeah. Somebody, the good Lord. Exactly. In my faith, I am very, yeah. very, very blessed. Yeah. He put within me a light, and I hope to let this little light shine. You graduate, of course, I mean, I mean, graduating, obviously, from the Honors College and getting a PPL degree, that's not easy. 
and you did it with while doing rehab while mm -hmm. recovering obviously it did not affect your cognitive skills even though you you've had some physical i mean yes. you were able to think you weren't blurry thought uh, thinking or anything early on were you not after well early on i was but after yeah. a point when i got my first real thought of my charge of life yeah i was focused okay you were focused at that point so you graduated and why did you decide on law school that's my outlet I love yeah. the way words can influence people. Right. In Mississippi, I know our legal system. My dad being in law enforcement, me looking at the more public policy side of it, laws impact people, good or bad. Law school at Ole Miss to me was staying in Mississippi, staying plugged in, knowing our laws and our system so I can give back in the way I know best, which is to use words. You talk about, we talk a lot about brain drain in Mississippi. Mm -hmm. You seem to be committed to the state. Yes. Yeah, in, in what way? Well, I've had my brain literally drained. <laughs> I'm committed to the state of Mississippi in the ways of healthcare and higher education right. as being our main impetus to growth. I think for me, leaving Mississippi is not an option. I will travel, I believe exposure is a good thing, but I think it takes at least one person saying, I'm not gonna leave. I'm very fortunate Ole Miss is a great law school. Yeah. We have many firms out of Mississippi looking at our students but I know that I need to stay here. I feel a personal conviction to Mississippi. You also reach out to people too, don't you? Yes, yeah. I, <laughs> I have since August 20th, 2014, made two new friends every day, except the days I was in a coma. I <laughs> think I might have an excuse for that one though. Oh, you were probably making friends, you're at least listening to them. At the oh yeah. I think it's fascinating though that you said that when you were in the coma, you could hear voices. Yes, I could hear everything they said. I can remember many of those things, the prayers, Yeah. Uh, the, cry, the quiet tidings, right. the why God, why, hearing that and then internalizing it, this is why. This is my menu. Set 2.0, this is why. Why God, why? To make a difference, I think. Right. That's so important to reframe something like that because you could literally have fallen into a pity party and not coming out. Yeah, and I did. Yeah. I, 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 I mean, did. that's perfectly normal, but you're not sitting right now oh, uh, no. serving snacks. No, no, no. no. It, it was a pity party. Pity festival in many points. Yeah. And then I realized, because of perspective, pity has nothing on perspective. Right. Looking one way and saying you can get better, the other way it could be so much worse, that's perspective. My perspective now that I'm back in Mississippi and the situation that many of our people are in, the perspective is that I've been privileged. I know my privilege. Yeah. I realize it, I understand it, and I'm gonna use it. It sounds like it also gave you empathy. In many, yes. Yeah. Yes. I have no choice but to be empathetic, and I'm so thankful for that. In many ways, I, I am truly thankful that I had a stroke, which... Wow, not many people say that. I, I am thankful yeah. that my life was changed this way. Did they ever figure out, was this something that was congenital, or what did they ever figure out what caused it? Uh, yes, so I was born with arterial venous malformation, or AVM. Mm -hmm. It was the equivalent of a brain tumor made of arteries and veins. Really? Like, like a ball of yarn of your arteries and veins yeah. get all tangled up together. It was the size of about two of my fists inside of my brain. Really? I never knew I had it. My brain had grown around it. Wow. And then just that you'd worked out that day and just something snapped. And my blood pressure got up and aneurysm formed like a perforated paper towel. The first part of it starts tearing, the rest of it comes with it. Wow. So I was born with this. So what says future? Seth's future for me, I would like, I'm gonna stay here. Yeah. That's baseline, that's bottom line. My foundation is here. Right. Getting involved in healthcare, higher education, getting involved in policy in Mississippi, networking with other Mississippians, going out, hearing their problems, other young Mississippians, those who wanna get involved in public sector, not making this the Seth show, making this the Mississippi story. Right. That's what I wanna do. I wanna talk to people, I don't wanna be on the billboards, I want to be in the boardrooms. I want to be talking to people in the hardware stores as I do. How about this? Let's talk about the hardware stores because aren't you making it a goal to see about yes. every hardware store you can see? There is a hardware store in every county of Mississippi. It is my goal to hit all of them and have a cup of coffee. So I will, I will visit by the time I graduate law school all 82 counties, stop at a hardware store in each, have a cup of coffee, talk to the people in a hardware store. I was taught my grandfather growing up, if you want to know what people are frustrated with, Talk to them while they're building something. That's what I like to do. Have my coffee in my container that I've had my entire life. Hot, 
have it any way you want it, whatever shade of coffee, like Mississippi. Mississippians are all like coffee. Come in many shades, different bitterness, different sweetness, <laughs> sometimes hot. You never know. I have a cup of coffee and I discuss with them their problems. I don't necessarily give what I think the solution should be because I don't know. Right. I'm not the smartest person in the room, but when I'm in a hardware store talking to Mississippians, I'm the person that has what I hope to say the biggest heart. So that sounds like um, you've been really given a second chance and you've really, t you've really seized it. And I'm very fortunate. You're very fortunate. Yes, yes. Sir. Any advice to anybody right now that's going through any struggles? Keep rolling along. Keep rolling along. I would along. say live your life like a river. No matter what gets in your way, let the current within you keep pushing the water, forge the way, move mountains, and keep rolling along. So, now how old are you now? I am 22, I'll be 23 on Wednesday. 23, and there was probably at one point you never thought you'd make it to this point. No, there was that moment in my floor looking up at the ceiling, I had six minutes to live. This is not far away from being six years ago. Right, that's incredible. So basically every day it's just, you're just glad to see the sunrise and you go from there. Every day is a blessing. I was telling others, I grew up influenced by Jerry Clower and Jesus Christ. One taught me the power of laughter, the other one taught me the power of love. And my life every day is to live a little bit like Jerry Clower and a lot like Jesus Christ. Yeah, you were telling me on the way down here yeah. today, you were listening to Jerry Clower on the way. I love the stories of Southern folk, Mississippians, living life, everything has a meaning to it. Somewhere deep within Aesop has his fables, Mississippians, we, we have our life. Well, Seth, thank you for sharing your story with us today. This has been incredible. I am much obliged for you having me.